Dziękujemy bardzo. Thank you very much. Na wystąpienie bardzo dobrze łączę się z kolejnym wykładem. Profesor Julie Davidson, która obecnie prowadzi pierwsze europejskie badanie sprawców uwadzenia dzieci przez internet, badając zarówno zachowanie, jak i motywację tych osób. Julia Davidson jest profesorem kryminologii, dyrektorem Departamentu Badań Społecznych na Uniwersytecie Kingston. Współpracuje również z Centrum Badań nad Krzywdzeniem i Traumą nad, na Uniwersytecie Londyńskim. Zapraszam. Hello. It's, I must say, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be able to present to this audience. Um, I'm much more used to presenting to uh, criminal justice practitioners and policy makers. So uh, I want to focus on the offender aspect today, and I hope that some of my material isn't too disturbing. Okay, so just to introduce myself, I'm Professor of Criminology at Kingston University and I'm co-director of the Centre for Abuse and Trauma Studies, which is a research centre that's split between Kingston University and Royal Holloway University of London. I've been working in the sexual abuse area mainly with serious sexual and violent offenders over a 20-year period. Uh, more recently, I've been working on internet abuse issues and I've been doing some work with criminal justice practitioners and with victims. So what I hope to present to you today is the research perspective. <coughs> First of all, concentrating on young people's risk-taking behavior online and their experiences online, and then focusing on sex offender behavior online. So my mission is twofold. First, to think about the research evidence around the context in which internet abuse occurs. And second, I want to introduce to you a piece of research which we've just started, a massive European study that explores the behaviors of online groomers. And I want to enlist your help in disseminating our findings about the offender's modus operandi. So I'll, I'll come to that a bit later on in my presentation. So first of all, some research I've recently conducted, it hasn't been published yet and won't be published until November. It's a large UK study looking at young people's online risk-taking behavior and their approaches to internet use. So we found in our study that a high proportion of young people reported having engaged in high-risk behavior. And this was defined by the degree to which they are prepared to share information with strangers online. This was particularly a feature amongst the 13 plus age group. It wasn't such a feature amongst under 13s. So we think that this age group, 13 to 16, is particularly at risk online. It was interesting to note that a large proportion of these kids had received some sort of internet safety awareness training. So they were internet safety aware. They'd had training programs at school. Uh, they discussed internet safety awareness with their peers. But particularly the 13 plus age group were still claiming that they would continue to engage in risk-taking behavior. This may be something about trying to work with teenagers and the teenage mindset. And that's a particular challenge, I think, for this audience. I think the problem is that as adults, we need to revisit our perceptions about young people's perceptions online. John said before that it's no longer really the right thing to talk about a difference between the real world and the virtual world because young people are so much a part of the virtual world, they don't make a distinction. They also don't see their behavior as particularly risk-taking. And this presents us with problems in trying to make them safety aware. 
some older research that uh, I did a few years ago around young people's perceptions on the internet. We found that there was a gender issue, that generally young people, both boys and girls, felt that girls were more at risk of attack. Now we know statistically that seems to be the case, but they had very stereotypical ideas about masculinity, so that if boys were attacked, they would feel more able to defend themselves. So there's a particular issue there in terms of internet safety around the way in which we work with boys. Most of the kids we spoke to felt safe because they felt, given that they use a particular language online, a particular slang, a text speak, if you like, a computer speak, that they would be able to recognize an adult posing as a child because of the type of language that they used. But very importantly for us, the kids were distinguishing between strangers and virtual friends. So the stranger danger message doesn't work here. You know, what we have to realize, and I know that you know this, but it's how we work with this in terms of internet safety, is that often kids have been interacting with people over a long period of time. And they're not strangers, they've become virtual friends. So if our safety messages are around don't meet up with strangers, the relationships they formed online are those of friendships. Just some quotes here from some of the kids we interviewed to illustrate the extent of their risk-taking behaviors. I would trust people after speaking online with them for a while. So then we asked, how long is a while? Perhaps after two weeks, then I'd know they were okay and would meet them. It would be all right if you met them out where there were lots of other people around. If they tell you to meet in a busy place and they are friends, if they ask you to meet at the back somewhere, then that's scary and you shouldn't go. So I think we have a lot of work to do in trying to understand young people's perceptions, behaviors, and ideas around risk taking. I want to move on to looking at offender use of the internet now. I've done talks, similar talks to this, all over the world to different audiences. And I'm often asked the question, is this not some kind of panic? Are children really at risk online? What is the, the nature of the risk? You know, is the situation really as bad as, we, as you say it is? But what we know from criminal justice agencies and from recent research is about the range of sex offender behaviors online. I'm going to focus a bit later in the talk on grooming behaviors. We know that sex offender behavior includes the construction of sites or virtual communities to be used for the exchange of information, experiences, and indecent images of children. These virtual communities are out there. They exist on a large scale, on a global scale. There are global paedophile networks operating on the internet. The organization, often via these networks, of criminal activities that seek to use children for prostitution and that produce indecent images of children at a professional level. There are also a growing number of informal offender networks. There's no pay-per-view involved for images within these networks. They swap, they collect, and swap decent images of children at different levels of risk of seriousness. The Organization of Criminal Activities that Promote Sexual Tourism, the posting, the open posting of sex offender profiles. And I've got an example of one to show you that I got from the police a bit later on, just, just to demonstrate 
how easily available the material is online. And the grooming of children for the purposes of sexual abuse. Grooming refers to a process of socialization whereby an offender targets and prepares a child for abuse over a period of time. And as part of that process, the offender will get to know the child, they'll get to know their likes and dislikes, their hobbies, and they will befriend them. They'll become a virtual friend in order to prepare them for abuse. This is an example of a sex offender virtual community. The Boy Love Forum. This is a place where sex offenders can meet online and talk about their sexual interests. And this is their mission statement. As boy lovers, we distance ourselves from the current discussion about child sexual abuse. Human sexuality plays the same part in a boy love relationship as it undoubtedly does in any relationship between human beings. A boy lover desires a friendly and close relationship with a boy. That's the website. There are many more of them. This is just one example. This is a profile, an example of a profile. This material has been provided by the police. If you have a look at this profile, I'm not sure if you can see at the bottom, but if you have a look at the interests that are listed at the bottom. This guy likes preschools. I can't see very well on my screen, so. Um, child abuse, babies, and he belongs to another forum called Cherry Popping Daddies. So these profiles are posted openly on the internet. I want to focus on online grooming. <coughs> online grooming. Now grooming is, has been legislated against in the UK and in Norway. And I was pleased to hear Jakob saying that the EU is looking at legislation around this area as well. Now, we thought in the past that there were few groomers online. We know that there's a huge problem in terms of scale around indecent images. But police officers, law enforcement, who act as undercover officers online, so they pose as children online in order to attract groomers are telling us that they have hundreds of hits every week from adult men looking for sex with children. So there's a quote here from a Metropolitan Police Officer, undercover officer from the High Tech Crime Unit. Grooming online was infrequent, but there's now a rich seam of perpetrators online every day. Officers act covertly as children on a regular basis, and we are catching offenders every week. And another quote from a practitioner working for the National Probation Service in the UK who says, I've worked, I've worked with men who spent months preparing a child for abuse online before meeting up with them. The lengths they will go to are extraordinary. I knew one man who spent a long time online learning children's computing language so that he could communicate more effectively and present himself as a child. He would spend time in chat rooms learning how children talk to each other and then go online to see if he was convincing. After a lot of test runs, eventually he was convincing. So the legislative context in the UK, I've put this slide on because um, it's a, an unusual scenario, I think, compared to the rest of Europe, although actually this legislation has been introduced in Norway. But under the Sexual Offences Act of 2003, Grooming is an offence, meeting a child following sexual grooming. Now, that applies under the legislation to the real world and to the virtual world. 
There have been cases of online grooming. We have convicted online groomers in, UK, in the UK prison system. There are only about 70 men at the moment, so uh, a slow trickle of cases coming through. I wanted to introduce you to this project, which has just started. It started in June of this year. We have funding from the European Commission Safer Internet Programme. This is the first European study of online groomers. The study presents many, many challenges, um, not least finding the groomers in different prison systems is one of the methodological challenges that we face, given that there are, are different legislative jurisdictions and different approaches. Six partners are working on this project from four different European countries. UK, Belgium, Italy and Norway are involved in the work. But our remit is to disseminate the findings of this research as widely around Europe and beyond as possible. The work is led by the National Centre for Social Research in the UK. So this is the project aim. What we're aiming to do is to interview men convicted of online grooming offences in the UK and Norway and men whose, uh, in, whose offended behaviour invo involves the use of new technologies for online grooming in other countries where the legislation is different. And we are exploring their modus operandi. We are looking at the context in which abuse occurs. We are looking at their victim targeting and selection practices. We're looking at the way in which they select victims, what makes particular victims more attractive than others. We are looking at the way in detail in which they perpetrate their offending behavior. The aim of the work is then to feed this information, this research data, back into practice. Practice in terms of um, criminal justice agency response to perpetrators around risk assessment and management, risk assessment and treatment, and also to inform safety practices and educational awareness initiatives. So we we'll be working closely with uh, CEOP in the UK to disseminate our findings, but with other similar nodes around Europe when the project finishes and at key stages during the project. This is the consortium. I won't hang around on this slide because there are others I want to, to get through, but uh, we have a very eminent research team. Peter Gottschalk from Norway. Uh, Professor Thierry Tham from Belgium and Professor Vincenzo Coretti from the University of Palermo, Italy. The kind of expertise we have in the consortium is criminological, uh, we have forensic psychologists, we have psychiatrists, we have lawyers as well on the team. So it's a criminal justice type research project but designed specifically to inform internet safety practices. These are our research objectives. I've really described those to you, so I won't uh, linger on those. In terms of dissemination, I think this is where I want to enlist your help today and uh, to introduce myself. Clearly, we'll be producing the standard reports for the EC, and those, those will be readily available. There will be a project website as well, which will be live at the end of this month, <coughs> and we would hope that all of you will Google us, um, despite their bad reputation in some quarters. <laughs> we hope that you will all Google us and keep up to date with our research findings, because they're for you, essentially, to use and to build into practice. We will be doing presentations and workshops to agencies around Europe and visiting key conferences in order to go through our findings and we have some to share. 
We're going to ask key stakeholders to participate in workshops from partner sites as well. We're hoping to persuade social networking sites to display some of our key safety findings. Um, we're still working on that. But certainly working with the uh, Safer Internet Programme <coughs> nodes in order to disseminate the findings. It's always a bit flat, isn't it, when you, um, a bit disappointing perhaps when you talk about research but have little to share. Because the work has just started, we don't have much to share. But we have undertaken a preliminary case file analysis, offender case file analysis. And I wanted to share some of our initial observations with you and then run through some uh, case studies from the Metropolitan Police. So, the offenders in our case file analysis, this isn't really a surprise, but when interviewed by the police, claimed that their behavior was a fantasy, and it was a role play, and that they never had any intention to perpetrate a sexual act against a child. Although, I have to say, all of these offenders had turned up, had appeared for a meeting with the child. We discovered that they're operating in different online communities, such as Cherry Popping Daddies, uh, Teens and Kinky Kids, chat rooms and peer-to-peer -peer networks, including High Five, MSN, and Facebook as well was on the list. We're, we're having some very interesting initial findings about grooming. All of the research to date indicates that grooming tends to be a lengthy process and involves a long process of socialization. In some of the cases we're seeing, the grooming period doesn't really exist. There's a very swift and direct approach and the language becomes very sexualized early on in the chat log conversation. So we may have to sh shift our thinking about the grooming approach. These offenders are sending or using indecent images as part of the grooming process. So they are not only grooming kids online, but sending them indecent images. Sometimes adult pornography, more often than not, child indecent images. I wanted to run through a couple of case studies that have kindly been given to me by the Metropolitan Police, who I've been working with over a period of about 10 years. So the first involves the grooming of a 14-year-old girl from Canada by a 34-year-old businessman from southwest England. The offender groomed the victim for six months before sending money so that she could buy some phone cards. And then they could communicate via text message. So you've got the use of other uh, technologies here as well, not just the internet in the grooming process. Offered to go and see her in Canada and was prepared to pay $500 for sex. He offered to pay more money in exchange for sex with the girl's 10-year-old friend. Asked if she could post her underwear and he asked the girl to send indecent images of herself and her friends for payment. Um, these cases, I have to say, anonymized, they've been convicted, so the information is in the public domain. This person, other previous criminal convictions for curb crawling, soliciting a prostitute, and for possession of cocaine. When the police seized his computer and analyzed it, he had a history of grooming another child who he'd met and sexually abused online, and he had 6,000 indecent images of children, oh, 6,000 images, many of which were indecent. He was also linked into a network of other sex offenders. That's case study one. Case study two. 34-year-old man met a 15-year-old girl from the US in England. Now this one is unusual. This man groomed both the mother and the girl for a long period of time. So I think the point here that I wanted to say that sometimes these offenders will groom other family members, not just the victim, but they'll look to draw in other family members as well. 
So he invited the girl back to his house where he performed oral sex on her. Mother noticed love bites on the girl's body and took her to the doctor. She contracted a sexually transmitted infection. He had previous criminal convictions for sexual abuse. Similarly, had met and sexually abused another child who he groomed online. He had 7,000 indecent images of children under the age of 16 on his computer and was linked in to an offender network. Okay, so what does the most recent research tell us about sex offender behavior on the internet? There is very little research in this area and it is dangerous to make assumptions about this offender group in the absence of solid empirical data. We are starting to build research in this area, but we must proceed with caution until we understand behaviours. Eleanor Martelozo recently conducted research in the UK with Metropolitan Police High Tech Crime Unit, 200 offender case files and police offender interviews. One of the clear messages from the preliminary research that we're conducting is that offender behavior does not seem to be to focus in one particular area. So we're seeing a fluidity of behaviors across offenses. We're seeing people who are not only groomers, but who have indecent images, who are traveling around the world to meet with children, who come from different social classes. So a kind of fluidity of behavior. The majority of groomers sent undercover police officers some type of adult pornography or child abuse images during the grooming process. Almost two thirds of the offenders expose themselves to the undercover officer, not an enviable job, via photograph or webcam. And some offenders use the images as a grooming tool. Other research from the United States Andre Hernandez, 150 convicted, incarcerated online offenders, all of whom were indecent image collectors, finding a link between indecent image collection and contact abuse. He says that by the end of the treatment program, 85% of the group admitted they had perpetrated a contact offence. The number of victims involved was an average of 13.56 victims per offender. This is self-report study. He used polygraph testing to validate offenders' self-report. Um, there's some controversy around that, but um, why would they lie, I guess? Immunity from prose further prosecution. Uh, Michael Cito's work, Michael Cito from Canada, 300 child pornography offenders, only 4% of his offenders were convicted for sexual abuse contact offences over a 3.9 year period. But this study is based on reconviction data, not on reoffending. So, you know, we don't know how accurate reconviction is. Not very accurate, I would guess, as an indicator of a level of offending. Okay, so to summarize, what we know from research so far is that grooming can be a lengthy process and can include the victim's family. But what we're seeing as well is that grooming can be very short. You know, we, you question whether we're right to talk about grooming here. I'm talking about literally within a few sentences this, this, the the uh, conversation becomes sexualized, and the offender makes their intention clear. Offenders employ different techniques in the grooming process, including webcams, mobile phones, sending of indecent images of adults and children. And we're possibly seeing a link between grooming, contact offending, and indecent image collection. But I certainly think we should be thinking about a fluidity in terms of offending behaviors. There may be some who are just 
in decent image collections who are just fantasists. But the evidence we're seeing so far is contradictory. Word of caution from somebody who runs, who used to run the sex offender treatment program for the Scottish Prison Service. There's no certainty that sex offenders using the internet are really that different as a group to those who don't. If they're using indecent internet images, are they any different to those who've used such images as part of a fantasy cycle in the past, but from different media? Sex offenders are an extremely heterogeneous group, but our research knowledge is really very limited here, and we should be really careful about how we risk assess and treat these offenders. So what are the implications for awareness and safety? There's a need to better understand young people's online risk-taking behavior, particularly the 13 plus group. There needs to be open dialogue with parents and teachers about sexualized online behavior and the nature of teen interactions. We found in our research, the research I mentioned initially, that some young people's online behavior is actually very sexualized. You know, you know this. They post sexualized images of themselves. Uh, they have sexualized conversations. So there's a dialogue to be had with them about the appropriateness of that kind of online behavior. I think we should be honest with young people about the dangers and the reality of grooming. Enable young people to report and discuss their worries. And referring as well to John's point around the industry role in monitoring sites and closing offender forums. I'm not really a technical person, but it seems to me that more could be done to try and control some of these sites. A coordinated approach is needed to what constitutes an international problem Children are at risk online. We know that sex offenders use the internet to access indecent images, to groom children, and to network. It may be possible to identify different types of internet offender in future on the basis of further good research. Offender online behavior appears fluid rather than fixed and limited to categories. I wanted to emphasize the importance of educational programs to raise awareness and the role of ISPs, global problem, which needs international solutions, international efforts. Thanks.